What's going on, guys? So we are back on the Barbend Podcast, and today we are joined by Dr. Pat Davidson and Dr. Jordan Shallow. And today's podcast is going to be slightly different. So as opposed to having a conversation that kind of flows, we pulled a bunch of questions from our Instagram page, our YouTube, and comments we get on articles, and we're going to let these two answer them. They're both brilliant in what they do, and I'm really curious to see how they answer and if there's any differences in answers and similarities and Without further ado, thank you guys for coming on. You know, we could only disappoint now, right? Yeah, After an intro know. like that, over promise, under deliver. Thanks, man. Appreciate I'm a that. big fan of having my tires pumped up and then just going flat out <laughs> the way. So. Just take them with us on the road. Roll. All right, let's do it. Open act. All right, so the way we're going to do it is I'm going to draw questions at random. Some of these questions might be a little bit more advanced in nature. Some of them might be very simple. Answer them however you feel. And obviously, if anybody wants to chime in, more than welcome to. We'll go one at a time, and then obviously once the first person's done answering, second person can jump in. We'll just kind of play it by ear as we go. But first one, served to you, Pat Davidson. All right. All right, the first question is, do you think sumo deadlifts should be judged in a different category of meets? Why or why not? No, they, they are within the current rules of powerlifting as it's written up. Uh, there's nothing stipulating that you cannot do it that way if you are a great sumo deadlifter and you beat everybody that conventional pulls, then you win. Yeah, I, I'm in complete agreement. Like, I think pick your deadlift stance that fits your particular strengths and morphology and, and go with that. Like, if you're disgruntled at and you're a conventional deadlifter, then there's nothing stopping you from switching to sumo. Yeah. And if you're weak and get beat by someone who's stronger than you, then get stronger. Fair. That's one of the like most frequent questions you get on any sumo deadlift article or video that we post it's insane actually you can almost predict exactly what you're going to get well you'd almost have to have the same conversation with bench press about standardizing yep. relative grip with the bench it's the same thing it's like physics versus biomechanics it's work at four times distance and then just doing the more work with this or more work with the same amount of force or less force by covering less distance or whatever that equation is yeah i, I mean i just look at this as always being um you know people get upset when they lose and oh, you only lost because this person has this trick up their sleeve. And it's like, but that's that's perfectly legit. Like it's, I, I always think like, I would imagine like if baseball players were like, oh, this is bullshit that Babe Ruth hit all these home runs. You can't bat left-handed. Like, why not? Like it's just a particular strategy. It's a way that you could accomplish the same task. There's nothing wrong with it. There's a deflate gate joke in there somewhere. I just can't find it. You know, <laughs> I'm gonna leave that alone. Just don't have your head pop off after God. the first question. Oh, we're starting off. <laughs> we're starting off strong. Dr. <laughs> Davidson is an avid Pats fan. Yes, I for am. anyone who uh, didn't catch on to that. And as a, we are the Freddy Krueger of sports fans. The more that you hate us and bring negative energy, the stronger that we get. So <laughs> that's, that's honestly fair. Yeah, I'm not even gonna dive into that right now. All right, next question served to Dr. Shallow. Do you think sumo deadlifts are easier than conventional deadlifts? This was random. I did not mean to pick two sumo I mean, questions. Well, I mean, to, no. Uh, for someone who's a conventional deadlifter, like, I'm not the size or shape or relative proportions to do. So, like, sumo deadlift is really hard for me. I'm way better. Like, I have stronger lats would make me a better conventional deadlifter. So, no, it's not, it's not harder. For some people, it might be easier or harder based off of their leverages or their relative strengths, but no. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's just, are you well suited for it or not? And if you are, great. You've got this, this huge advantage, it seems like. Uh, cause there's definitely people that don't look super strong that just crush enormous sumo deadlifts. And then there's, there's people that look like unbelievably strong and like their deadlift is disappointing. And I think that's what people get butthurt over. But it's, it's not necessarily that it's like better, worse, easier, harder. It's just, hey, if, if you can do this really well, you've got this, this great ability. Yeah. Rock on. You're a good power lifter. You know, I think that when the discussion goes outside of powerlifting, is sumo deadlifting a good idea for other goals? That's a more interesting discussion in some ways. But just for the sake of, of powerlifting and whether or not it's uh, acceptable or easier or it's just available as an option. And if you can excel with that, then more power to you. And you're better at that particular sport than other people are. And I think also powerlifting self-regulating in the sense that, look, the same leverages that likely make the majority of good sumo deadlifters good sumo deadlifters make them dog shit squatters and bench pressers, right? Because they're going to have these long like arms that benefit them in their sumo and cutting the distance in the way the bar travels. But those same long arms are going to come to a disadvantage when they have to bench press. 
right? So it's like, if you have like, one of the best sumo deadlifters right now is a kid named Kayla Wollum. Mm -hmm. Kayla pulls 953, but so he almost has a thousand pound deadlift with just over a 2000 pound total. It's like, that's not great in the sport of powerlifting. Like that doesn't necessarily, I mean, he's a great powerlifter, but when you think of relative numbers, like that's not great that your total is carried by a third of your, the third of the lifts. So I think it's, it's self-regulating in the sense that, look, powerlifting is not just the deadlift. It's on a deadlift only competition. There's a bench and squat. And you know, the same thing that might make Ray Williams a really good squatter, who squats a well over a thousand pounds like that, that relatively wide base of support is going to play to a disadvantage when he has, then has to bend over and pick up a bar, right? So the nice part about the sport is that it does keep some balance when you have to start playing these these difference in leverages and morphology and things like that. I love that. I love that take. I love your opinion there too. Next question for Pat Davidson. Do you ever employ post-activation potentiation in your programs? Why or why not? Yeah, I've, I've employed that for quite a while. Um, you know, I wrote Mass 2, and it uses a lot of concepts that are from PAP. And, you know, I, number one, it's, it's rare to find anything that seems to improve your ability to produce more force in high rate of force development activities. You know, it's like uh, almost any idiot can put a program together that makes people stronger or uh, allows for hypertrophy. But to actually change high velocity force production is very hard. Like it's much harder to make someone a faster sprinter or to jump higher or to throw an implement farther uh, than it is to just m move a heavier barbell. And that's generally speaking. Obviously when you get to the extremes of like, you know, the most elite power lifters adding five pounds to a squat or a bench press can be a, a very daunting task. But for the most part, um, changing things at the high end of the speed continuum is difficult. And there's not a lot of evidence, like real peer-reviewed research, that would support any particular methodology. But there is quite a bit of data that shows how effective post-activation potentiation is. And you know, it's it's kind of like when you look at the logistics of putting an exercise program together. Oftentimes, like, oh, this thing's evidence supported, but from a logistical standpoint, it's difficult to see where it would fit in from a workout. But when you talk about PAP, it, it's not that difficult. Like you do a heavy lift and you follow it up immediately with an explosive activity that's lighter, that's not that difficult to do. Like it doesn't really eat up an excessive amount of time. It's, um, it, it really allows for the best of both worlds. We're able to marry the theoretical information that's supported from research with practical applications that actually fit nicely into the way that a, 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 a good solid session could be meshed together. Yeah, I mean, working in the strength and conditioning field and talking a lot about like logistics, like, you know, you can have all the greatest evidence in the world, but if you have, if you have run two sessions in succession with 25 kids in a small weight room and you're, you're dealing with a bunch of rugby players, it's like, I don't, know of a more effective method that fits into the logistics of an actual strength conditioning session than PAP. Like, yeah. look, we're going to do like, uh, like heavy mid thigh pulls and then do box jumps or go on a prowler. It's like, if you have like any sort of like, setup can accommodate for that. I think a lot of people, they get lost in the idea of training for sports performance and then training for aesthetics and strength. Like Pat said, it's kind of two different worlds. So when you deal with sports performance, it's like, yeah, you'd almost be silly not to because it is so accessible and it is so effective. Yeah, I love that. I love that a lot because I love I love PAP as well. That's what I did my capstone on, actually, on cheerleaders, improving their back tucks and their explosiveness off the ground. Yeah. That's because I was a cheerleader. It's, I mean, when I was a professor at Springfield College, I feel like I was on seven or eight uh, committees my, my second year there. And I feel like every single one was on post-activation really? potentiation. So I just felt like I was constantly reading the literature in there. And it was like, man, there is a boatload of research supporting this stuff. And, and I felt like I did not see enough of the students who were strength and conditioning coaches at that school using it. It was like, you're doing your thesis on it. You're supporting it. Like, where is it in your programming for your athletes? Like, you know, uh, let's, let's put two and two together here. Well, I guess to follow that up and just go a level deeper, when it comes to coupling exercises together, have you guys seen a pairing that works a little bit better than others? So for example, like a back squat with a box jump or maybe a front squat to a broad jump. What do you guys see with the pairings and what works best? 
I think it depends. Sorry, I think it depends on specificity of the sport and like what planes you need to be strong in for that particular sport. Like in in dealing with like rugby players at the collegiate level, it's like more hinging movements seem to be more beneficial because they spend the majority of their time in the sport like actually in a lower position than most sports. Where a lot of people think the deadlift isn't doesn't have a good carryover, isn't dynamically correspondent to sports. It's like well, it depends on what sport, right? So in my experience, you know, pairing heavy hinging movements with something a little bit more. Um, like some sort of prowler push or something like that was beneficial because that was what emulated the, the the parameters of the sport. So I think that has to be taken into consideration. It's like you're not just trying to get more powerful to get more powerful. Like the the objective outcome is actually you know your numbers. It's like yeah, you worry about force output and you can measure it in hertz and all this stuff. But like, what's your record? Like, did you did you guys go like 0 and 82 last year? Like those are the numbers that really matter at the end of the day. So when you pairing exercise selection, it's like what has the greatest amount of dynamic correspondence to the actual sport. Awesome. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. And, and, you know, for me, like, uh, it, I, I really like the French contrast method that I originally read from Cal Dietz. Um, mm. and, and it's funny, I've never actually seen any research that's talked specifically about the French contrast method. But in, in his book, Triphasic Training, he talks about how he used that quite a bit with his hockey players at Minnesota. And, you know, it doesn't give exactly like you have to do this specific exercise in this vector or plane, but it's more that you're going to do your, your heavy barbell exercise and you're going to follow that with a sequence of three different explosive activities. The first one would be uh, body weight. The second one would be heavier than body weight. And the third one would be lighter than body weight. And uh, so that you're really trying to hit everything along like the rate of force development continuum during this and uh from so what i've done a lot like i tend to like the squat a little bit more as the heavy exercise to prime people um you know and because i can control tempo a little bit more because it starts at the top and i can sort of focus on the eccentric without having to start it with a the up phase of a deadlift but um you know typically i'll do something like a squat followed by like a body weight jump typically something that would be like a box jump or progressed like a hurdle jump or uh, a depth jump, something along those lines, followed by a weighted jump. And, um, you know, we have a lot of Kaiser equipment. We have the Kaiser squat jump. So we're able to actually quantify how much power on every jump. Uh, so we can kind of dial it in like, well, when we give this person 200 pounds, it peaks their power. When they're at 150, the power is less. When they go to 220, the power is less. So we can really kind of dial that in. And then the third one is oftentimes a lightened method jump of having a band hung up on a pull-up bar so that when you jump, it's actually, you know, taking some of your body weight away. It almost feels like you're jumping on the moon or something like that. But, um, you know, just watching people's numbers, it's like that, that method, I've never seen it not really shift people in a positive direction for force production at different velocity zones. Not just your heavy stuff, but like vertical jump improving, like all of the ground contact stuff that's that's faster ground contacts seem to get dragged right along with that. It's a it's a nice protocol. Gotcha. That's awesome. Well, thank you guys, Dr. Shallow. Question for you: What are your favorite exercises for targeting the vastus lateralis? For targeting the lateralis. Yeah. Well, like, do you have any specific for a uh, outer quad? I mean, this is a oh, pop, pretty popular question we get actually. I don't know to what degree you can. <clears throat> isolate, I mean, if you put your hip in extension and extend your knee, you'll take the rectus femoris out of it because you'll disadvantage it because you're in hip extension. Like, I know the research on like squat width is pretty, it's pretty like concrete in the sense that look, the width of your squat isn't gonna dictate really like knee extension is knee extension. Like if you go super wide on a leg press and your tibia and your femur create the same amount of relative flexion at the knee, then it's, it's not gonna bias the sweep versus the teardrop or whatever the yeah. bro nomenclature is. So I think I've read some research on toes in versus toes out being preferential to VMO versus lateralis on the leg extension and a quad extension. Uh, to what degree I think that really matters in putting tension across fibers of the lateralis, I don't really know. If I'm not mistaken, it's, I want to say toes in is lateral or toes in is VMO and toes out is lateralis, if, if I remember correctly. but. I, yeah, honestly, I'd just load a squat past 90 and you'll likely get the job done. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, do you have a better answer to that? I saw something that was comparing. It was basically saying that the squat will prefer, or preferentially develop 
the lateralis and medialis, uh, and that lunges will preferentially develop adductors, and that really the only thing that kind of like nails the rectus femoris is the knee extension. But if so, to me, it's like the squat would probably be the best choice for vastus lateralis, but it's like one of those questions that to me brings up like probably someone that is overthinking and under training. And it's like, if that's your primary worry, I'm, I'm immediately just thinking you've probably never trained that hard or intelligently to see the way that just good, solid, well-rounded programming just brings, it's like the, it's the tide that rises and brings all the ships with it, as opposed to somebody that's probably trying to pick the fly shit out of the pepper and do all these tiny little, you know, uh, exercises that aren't going to really drive much. It's like, you know, it, this is like the just shut up and squat kind of answer. Like, don't worry about, you know, minutia when we have bigger fish to fry. Got it. Good. 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 Moving on. Back to Davidson. Do you have any alternatives for building strong glutes besides squatting and hip thrusts that you love? Deadlifting, sprinting. Um, you know, I honestly, like I, I think, uh, yeah, probably sprinting is, is one of the best ones. Um, you know, I've never seen really fast people or people that do a lot of track and field have bad glutes, you know, it's like track butts or a thing, but, um, you know, it's also just like distribution of where your, your weight is on your feet is, is probably a big one. Like, you know, I'm, I'm constantly trying to get people to actually squat their squat and not hinge their squat up. And it's like, most of the time I just see people just like, you know, compressing their back and, and deadlifting their squats up. And it's like, well, you didn't really do any squats. You said you did like, you know, three sets of squats and three sets of deadlifts. I just saw six sets of deadlifts. Um, so if I can get someone to actually squat deep and then come out of that in like their body looks like it's in an elevator shaft rather than like the body folding and, and that whole thing. Usually people like really feel their glutes working. And, and also like, I think people just like always forget about like the leg press. Um, you know, if, if you keep your foot nice and flat, you keep your thighs tracking over the feet and you go full range on a leg press, like very few things are going to recruit more total muscle mass and, uh, and, and just lead to greater total metabolic output of the lower extremity than that. So, uh, like, but you know, I think that also just, uh, well executed split squats and lunges, you know, if you, again, like I see most people do lunges and it just, they fold and it's like basically like a moving, you know, deadlift again. Uh, if people squat their squats and squat their split squats and do heavy leg press and sprint, uh, I'm pretty sure we'll we'll put some butts on people. It's, I, I don't understand. Like, there's no such thing as stubborn muscle groups, just stubborn yeah. people. It's like, look, there's tension and there's fibers, right? Like, just put fucking tension across fibers. It's not that hard. It's no different than growing pecs or lats. Like, no origin, no insertion, no action. Know how to apply load through that muscle action as it moves from origin to insertion. You'd be sweet. I think there's, yeah, it's not splitting the atom. Like, you have a pelvis that's stable. That'll probably help. So you have a core that can primarily stabilize your pelvis. So you can actually put that pelvis from posterior to anterior, which is one of the great things about sprinting that it does really well. And that's why the glutes are like sprinter, butt. that's a thing. It's because they're just moving their pelvis from this place back here to that place over there. And that's basically what the glute max does, right? Not to, I mean, not to mention it is the largest muscle in our body, but behind that strength in the glute med would help if like you're going for an overall aesthetic, it's like the glute meat is 50% the size of the glute max. And it's like, all right, well, if the glute max is the largest muscle in our body and this thing is half the size of it, knowing how to train that properly, if you want to disadvantage the glute max, it's, you know, that shows that abduction and internal rotation will prioritize the glute meat, even though the posterior fibers will externally rotate. So having stable hips, stable pelvis, and then just put tension across fibers. Don't really like the hip thrust. I don't think the ASIS is a weight bearing joint. It's basically an orthopedic test in which you your body can manage shear at the um, at the SI joint. I think, yeah, hip hinging. Um, if you can fix the profile on something like a, um, a reverse hyper, you can fix like a resistance profile on something like a reverse hyper to have it match the strength curve. I think so something like that's effective. Unilateral movements, I think, are, are really effective because, again, all we're doing is just moving that pelvis from posterior to anterior, posterior to anterior. Um, 45 degree low back extension. 
a lot of people miss that like there's an upper fiber of the glute which is like the primary muscle mass of the glute max but also, also a lower fiber lower fiber acts as an adductor uh, so a lot of people miss that like a lot of people in you know more body composition sports they call it like i'm holding a lot of water it's like <laughs> no you're not you just don't have muscle there because you don't realize that the lower fiber of the glute max is an adductor you just haven't trained tension across those fibers so it's it's more or less just a an imposition on someone's understanding of muscle anatomy as a whole. So it's like a lot of people just have a, a big misunderstanding because there's a lot of noise based around training that muscle group in isolation. Yeah, I was gonna actually, you know, one of the questions that were in here that I actually threw out was hip thrust, do you think they're overrated or underrated? And from what you, from what you just said, I think that's an overrated. 100%, 100%, in my opinion anyways. I don't use the exercise personally or with anybody. Um, you know, I do, I do exercises that involve bridging the hips but I have them executed in a very different manner. Like essentially like I'm trying to bring the ischial tuberosity on the pelvis towards the posterior neck of the femur and keep it there. Uh, and, and that's true hip extension. And because most of the time when I see people just thrust their hips through space, they're just going to be driving their pelvis. Like the, the ischial tuberosity is the big bone on the backside of the pelvis. It's where your hamstring connects. It's if you push directly into the middle of your butt, you would feel a bone there eventually. But essentially, it's almost like I've got a leg bone that's trying to move. I'm trying to move the leg bone backwards, and I'm trying to keep the back of the pelvis there. And most of the time, I see people try to push their pelvis forward, and they just simply lose their pelvis in space. So it's almost like the relationship between the two bones never changes. Whereas I want to keep this here and then move this on top of it without that happening, I've never seen someone do a loaded hip thrust and demonstrate what I'm looking for. So it's, it's, it's possible to do effective bridges that truly target the glute max, but I don't think that there'll ever be things that are done with a significantly heavy barbell. And I don't think that's anything that I particularly want to add to the system anyways. So it's, it's more that it, I don't hate the concept of a hip bridge, I would just get to the end goal of it through different means than what people are currently using in a widespread manner across the exercise scene. Gotcha. Done. Dr. Shallow, this one's for you. Long one. When doing your first compound movement of the day with the most energy demanding sets, should you do absolutely nothing in between your sets or is it okay to do some passive mobility and strength work depending on that it doesn't take away from your main working sets? What is your kind of go-to logic here? Um, yeah, so I don't really <coughs> like the wording of that because I, I think mobility to a certain degree, if you look at research, can be a hindrance in force output. But I think a lot of the methodologies and the research that prove that are kind of like not really real world applicable. Like I'm not going to hold like a modified hurdler stretch for a minute and a half and then go into a vertical jump. That's probably a really shitty way to get a vertical jump. It's probably a good way to tear my fucking hamstring, right? Um, but I mean, strength is very much positionally related. And so if you're struggling based on whatever perception to get into a good position of a compound movement, say like squat, and you want to put in some sort of, I mean, I prefer stability work over mobility work, which is, I think is something that we might like see a different through a different lens on, but like an ability of a muscle to resist force is different than a muscle's ability to exert force, roughly speaking. So I think it's okay in early stages where it's like, if I'm warming up on an empty bar, I think the big takeaway would be, look, integrate any sort of quote unquote corrective, whatever you want to call it stuff in early stages, but don't do it as a separate thing. Like, you know, it's all just a scale of dynamics, like a scale of input on your nervous system. Like something like static stretching can be very passive and something like a max effort squat could be very active, right? So I look at it almost like a baton pass where it's like your warm up or your, your activation or whatever you want to call it is that's passing the baton to your workout. So the goal is to get better at squatting. The goal is to get better at a single leg RDL or you get better at foam rolling or whatever. But like if you have a theory retested against the objective outcome, so it's like if my calves are tight, if I stretch my calves and then I squat and I don't have a hip shift anymore because I'm leaning away from that limited dorsiflexion in that opposite hip or on that opposite ankle, then it's like, I don't really care as long as I'm getting the desired outcome against the objective outcome, which is a squat, right? So I think there's a lot of people that get dogmatic around like their movement preparation strategies or practices where it's like, you're, you're, I don't care if anyone's a professional at warming up, right? So I think it's, if it helps 
improve your perception and relative position for that compound movement, sure. Because guess what? My if I have like a hip shift due to a decrease in, in dorsiflexion in one of my ankles, that'll set to a detriment my top end work in that squat greater than any sort of look. If stretching your calves causes you so much fatigue that it's like 20 kilos off your top set, it's like you have way bigger fish to fry. So that's kind of the way I look at it. Like whatever you're gonna do, fine, do it. I think understanding that scale of dynamics of don't go super passive static stretching into heavy dynamic compound load bridge the gap with just things that are have a little bit higher input and, and to me those things are usually unilateral movements testing our ability to exert force through some muscles through the hip and spine um, then if you're doing that re-integrate like, it against the thing that actually that you care about right so don't just do this 45 minute warm-up thing on the turf area at your 24-hour fitness and then go to a squat rack it's like be very selective in the interventions that you're going to apply for this particular exercise go to the damn squat rack Squat the empty bar, then go off into your myriad of drills you want to do between the empty bar and 95 pounds. How do you feel? Good. Oh, you feel great? Sweet. Then stop doing them. Go 135, 185, 225, and onward. Oh, okay. That ankle's still bugging you? Yeah. If you want to do something between 95 and 135, great. Go ahead. But then th there's a point where the baton is passed and the workout is started, and then the warming up stuff is done, right? So sometimes that transition period might be longer. Like, you know, you get off that plane from Slovenia, he's not gonna be like two sets to a top to a top max, right? It might take a little bit longer, but if you know, you're know you up on your feet and you're feeling good, then save it, right? If you don't need to do it, don't do it. I think a lot of people miss that ability to be um, like adaptive based off how they feel. It's like, oh no, coach said I had to do my, my foam roll and stuff. And it's like, look, if you feel good, scrap it. Because it's all about how you feel on the bar, right? So I think that's, that's a, a workaround way of answering the question. Gotcha. Yeah, I think I, if I remember correctly, the context was somebody was asking about warming up for the bench press and doing band tears in between. So work like that, that they felt like got them into position or something, if I remember correctly, in the context of which this question was asked. So, yeah, I feel like you kind of might have answered, you, you did answer that, but like it was, I think it was a poorly worded question to begin with, probably with a little bit of misleading interpretation of how they took the work and yeah, I mean, in that specific case of like bands and strengthening, and then again, you get into resistance profiles and strength. Yeah. Like, hey, if, it, if you feel, if it feels good, do it, man. I feel like that guy may have already had his answer in his question, so <laughs> thumbs up because he sounds like he's going to keep doing what he wants to do, anyways. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I look at, I, I hate the word mobility. I just think it's a garbage term. Um, all it means is that you have the ability to move. Doesn't tell me anything. Like, so I'm always looking at. Let me actually measure you on a table. Let me see what range of motion your joints actually possess. If you have clear red flags from certain joints that are nowhere near human norms for range of motion, it indicates to me that you do not possess the ability to actually execute certain movements biomechanically properly. Okay, So I could try to coach you or come up with drills for you from now until the cows come home. And, and, you know, either I'm able to unlock this motion and give you the ability to have human norms for range of motion for ankle, shoulder, hip, knee, whatever, or, or not. So I have to make that determination first. Like, do you have the ability, do, do you right now lack human norms for motion at this joint? Can I create a drill that gives you back human norms? If I can, great. That drill is probably a good activity for you to do prior to doing something that would require that specific range of motion to be able to execute. Like if someone has zero degrees of ankle dorsiflexion and they want to do full depth squatting, well, you can't, I'm sorry. Like you're a nice person and everything, you just physically cannot do this activity. So if I can conjure up a drill that for you gives you this motion back and I can measure it and see that now you possess 10 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion, that's sufficient for full range squatting. By all means, let's learn how to squat properly and now train the squat. So I, I just look at things like from the perspective of uh, like step number one, what is the motion that you're trying to, uh, what is the task you're trying to accomplish? What motions from joints around your body do you need to complete this task as close to optimal as possible? Are there giant red flags of on your measurements that would be contraindicate that would contraindicate your ability to do this activity? If yes, can we create drills that give you those motions? 
if we can give you drills that give you back those motions, it doesn't mean you know how to do the task properly. It just gives you entry into motor learning 101 for the task. Now I have to coach you on how to do this task. Now the cool thing is, if this is a task whose prerequisite is to have certain ranges of motion, and you're doing the task properly, guess what? You no longer need mobility work in the future going forward because the task itself is the mobility work, okay? You should hold on to those ranges of motion if you're doing this properly. Like your brain should remember these things and have a dominant response that executes the task with those joints moving a certain amount of, of degrees. So it, like, to me, the people that I see always doing extreme amounts of mobility work are usually the people that actually already possess the prerequisite ranges of motion. They're good at demonstrating flexibility. They like doing flexibility. They like to show off. It makes them feel good. Where it's like, no, you already have what it takes. Just do the goddamn thing and train it. And if you do that, now you're like, tell me what your goals are. You know, are your goals to just be the mobility king? Uh, and, and because you already have that, like, but you're, you're ver verbally telling me that your goal is something else. Your goal is to squat more, deadlift more, whatever the hell it is. And you're actually not following the systematic path towards that which you're vocalizing as your goal. So either what you're telling me is not what you actually feel or your awareness about what the path is to this is, is, is off. Like, uh, so I think that the question really relates more towards like that primarily is like the discussion point. Like, is this someone that, that is just trying to demonstrate that they're like, I think some people assume that they think that it, they're going to look smart if they're doing all these mobility drills, who cares? Like, what do you want? Uh, it's probably not to be, like you said, like, you know, the, the best at warming up. Like, it, I feel like Kenny Powers with that answer. Like, uh, well, I think it's, it's just really hard to get strong. And I think that's where people are like, oh, this is the game where now it's played and I got to get stronger now. It's like, no, I'd rather just roll around with like lacrosse ball and like show how well I can actively internally rotate when I'm in a 90, 90 position. Like that's adorable. Could you please move aside while the real adults try and actually get strong? Like, I think it, it's like, you can't out corrective exercise, bad exercise to Pat's point about, look, you now have the base level code in which to perform this skill properly. You have the requisite range of motion does not mean you are then guaranteed and warranted then license the ability to actually perform this exercise properly. Like you can't single leg RDL your way to good squat mechanics. It's like you actually have to know how to squat. Now you can do that and it can prove some sort of functional prerequisite of, you know, hip stability or ankle dorsiflexion or whatever. But like when the rubber hits the road, you actually have to put all these moving parts together in series and in proper timing and actually execute the damn thing. I just think the execution of the damn thing is the hard part. People are like, oh, I got to do all that. Oh, that looks heavy. I'm just going to keep phone rolling. Got it. Next question. Ooh, what are your favorite three exercises for training in the transverse plane of motion? <laughs> I think it's that one up. coming to me first. I think it's oh yeah, up. that one's yeah. coming to you first. So you know, this is this is a um, you know, I'm uh, probably my biggest mentor is Bill Hartman, and he is of the belief that there is only a transverse plane, that there is not a sagittal plane or a frontal plane, that everything actually takes place in the transverse plane. And uh, that which, which, so there's only IR and ER, and uh, that which you observe and think is flexion and abduction is actually just another representation of external rota rotation. And that which you observe as extension and adduction is just another representation of internal rotation. And, um, so, so I'm heavily biased because of, I, I just think that this yeah. is the dude, you know what I mean? Like yeah. if, if, I think if anyone truly understands motion, uh, I, that's, that's my guy. So it's, it's always painful for me to say things along the lines of like this sagittal plane drill or this frontal plane drill, because I, I am in his camp that there's no such thing as frontal or sagittal. It's all, everything is an expression of, of transverse. But I also respect the fact that just like, hey, that way is forward and that way is sideways and this is like twisting. So, you know, I'll play along with the game. Uh, so, you know, from the, it was, what are my favorite three transverse plane yeah. exercises? Um, you know, I like to, I like to hit 
balls. Like uh, I've always liked baseball and I like golf. I like to just smash things with clubs. Uh, to me, that's the only transverse thing that like, you know, as an activity. So like when I think about that from like a weight room perspective, it's like, I think, I think the transverse plane is, is largely like your throwing plane. You know, it's like creating that explosion. So I think of it as like medicine ball throws, things like chops, lifts, punching. So it, to me, like from, from like, what do we really do in the weight room that's truly transverse? It's this like, you know, it's all, it's like what people like market is like training rotational athletes. Like we're going to do med ball throws. We're going to do chops and lifts. We're going to do the, those kinds of things. Um, you know, I have some specific setups that I like for med ball throws over, over some other setups, but, but generally speaking, throw things and try to smash things. And, and that to me is real transverse plane training, you know? So cool. I, I, I agree a hundred percent with the bill thing and like really like, cause to me, everything exists in the rotational plane, like whether it's locally at muscles that I think are probably the most important and underutilized. And that's like muscles that have like a transverse orientation, like, don't tell me you have a weak rotator cuff when it's like gravity goes this way and the infraspinatus goes this way. Don't tell me your piriformis is weak and that's why you're applying bands to it. It's like, first off, the bands don't really make sense from adding resistance to strengthening muscles anyways, but aside from that, the piriformis goes like that, right? Or like, you're, oh, you have a weak core. It's like your transverse abdominus goes like that. So to me, that's like, I'm of the similar thought process that like everything is a movement in the transverse plane. Um, for me, I just look at, Function, like when I, I mean, function is kind of a bastardized term, but like for me, function is how muscles behave when you walk and breathe, right? So it's some sort of iteration, like uh, like I really like the Bulgarian split squat or like the rear foot elevated split squat. And to double down on movement or training in the transverse plane, I'll just throw a dumbbell in the opposite hand of the stance leg. Ooh, that's like a whole lot of force through the rotational plane that they have to resist, right? And so that's one, um, a landmine press. If you load in gait cycle, so if I'm pressing with my right hand and I have my left foot forward, it's like opposite hip, opposite shoulder. There's a huge amount of rotation and counter rotation force in that exercise. So basically anything that mimics gait cycle movement is going to be an exercise in the transverse plane. So that's kind of my preference when it comes to that. I mean, I know that was only two. Um, like carries, like do a unilateral carry. That's going to do a bilateral carry. That's going to be sort of every time you take a step forward and the opposite shoulder rotates to the opposite hip, it's like that's going to be rotation. And so I think everything should be looked at in that way to a certain degree. Like you, you can ascribe to the idea that look, maybe squatting and deadlifting, you know, I understand you know, like that's forward and that's to the side. And you know, sometimes a power lifter struggles with a walkout because it's like, oh no, we need to actually step out to the side. And it's like, okay, that's, that's fine. Perhaps they are more akin to just this particular pattern. Um, but for me, anything that derives like true function of the hips and shoulders and spine, which is usually like, how, are, how we organize movement through gait cycle. And then we just load that with some sort of unilateral load that causes people to be unstable through a plane of rotation rather than like lateral flexion, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. I think, that you, I think you guys nailed that. Honestly, that's a lot of info and I think that people can take a lot out of that. Next question we got. What was Move, that? <laughs> moving on. <laughs> I, <really wanted> to <laughs> what that was. I can't wait to see what that one was. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> this is for you, Dr. Shallow. Bring it on. What is your favorite tool or exercise for fixing severe knee valgus in the squat? Tempo. I think, yeah, like probably tempo. Spend more time in the position that it seems to be bothersome. Like there's a weird side conversation going on of like, oh, it's the glute meat or no, it's the adductor pulling it in. It's a sign of hip stability if it goes in below 90 because the piriformis switches roll or whatever. It's like... I don't know, the knee joint kind of likes to do this. And if I'm at a point where it's like this, I kind of wanted to do that. So I think just spending more time in that position is going to help better like gain like an acuity or an awareness of that knee, whether or not it tracks in or out. I, I don't think there's, there's much more to it than that. Like I'll use a mirror, like look, look in the mirror, great. Now we're going to take the mirror away. Now you need to adhere this to a longer term memory. And then I'll film it and be like, hey, so rep three felt really good. Great. What did you do in rep three? Here, watch. Watch rep three. Okay, great. So I, I think for me, the best tool is time. Time is probably going to solidify that better than any single leg, whatever the hell, or banded tactical cue or anything like that. Got it. I coach a lot from the feet. 
um, particularly with squatting. You know, I, I always have people try to, you know, just stand and find their feet and like just, hey, is there any particular part of your foot that you don't feel that much weight on, you know, or do you feel more in one particular area? I just have people, I love that you went with time because I, I mean, I would do the same thing. Like I, I've got a playbook of rules that I follow and, uh, and one of those rules is start static before going dynamic. And so static to me is the ultimate of, of, of stopping time as best I possibly can. And then I'll, I'll just add velocity over time. But you, you can't learn anything if you're going fast because you can't feel things if you're going fast. Like if the slower you go, the more that you can feel. And I oftentimes just have people really pay attention to, you, to their feet. And like, so we're gonna go really slow. And at a certain point, like, you know, I'm like, hey, I want you to maintain that same level of foot contact. Everything that you felt at the top, you should be able to feel now. And oftentimes people, and I have other drills that I do on the ground too with people with, with finding their feet and moving their body. And like, they start to notice trends of like, oh yeah, I really like lose this part of my foot when I try to do this activity. And it's like, oh yeah, okay, well, well when you lose that part of your foot, like, does it feel different doing that movement versus when you keep that part of their foot? And like, oh yeah, when I have my whole foot on the ground, like, yeah, I, I feel like I'm using my butt more or something along those lines. And, and I'm of the same point. Like I almost, I'm like, I don't care about like which specific muscle and like what, like it, generally speaking, when I'm watching it take place in front of me, like I, I try to give people mental pictures that they can try to think of. Like I'm always coaching the squat from the leg and the foot and the ankle by telling people about like, hey, you ever hit a, a nail into a piece of wood? I'm like, would you, you know, how would you want to hit it with the hammer? You'd want to hit it straight down. And how would you want to hold the nail? Like you wouldn't want to hold it off to the side. You would want it to go straight down into the wood. And how would the wood be? The wood wouldn't be like lopsided. You want a level piece of wood that you hold a nail straight up and down into and you hit it with the hammer straight down into the top of the nail. The femur is the hammer. The tibia is the nail and the wood is basically the ankle and the foot, you know? And so like giving people that picture oftentimes really helps them. And it's like, hey, let's just start from the ground up. Let's make sure that our base is level and that you don't have a piece of wood you're trying to hit a nail into that's that's off kilter. And, and from there, people can begin to understand that kind of stuff. So it, it really, uh, that to me is like the art of coaching versus all of like whatever's going on in the background mechanistically in terms of levers and pulleys and muscles and, and, and that kind of stuff. I love that. I love all that take. That's, I feel like, so essentially for a lot of knee valgus issues, a lot of it comes down to coaching and just body awareness of your own joints through time and space. For the, like, yeah, I, I mean, there could be imbalance of weaknesses. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's there's morphological considerations you can yeah. make about Q angle and is the knee really going in outside of an anatomical normal based off that person's morphology? And that's another conversation. And you can't have the conversation. Like, if you look at high level powerlifters, like, there is somewhat of a moment of like the knees twitching in at depth greater than 90 degrees. And you could have the conversation. But again, it's the lateralis. Like, you know, most people are stepping over $100 bills trying to pick up quarters here. It's like, let's just nail the basics first. And when we're knocking down the, you know, the door of a world record, we need to have these more nuanced conversations. We can do that. Frankly, the people that need to hear that probably aren't listening to this podcast. Fair yeah. enough. You know, I think, um, you know, one piece when, when I think of knees and I think of, you know, I think of feet and I think of hips typically. And it's like, what, what sort of strategy is this person trying to accomplish? And like, to me, a squat is something where you need to have the, the, you need to increase dorsiflexion, you need the knees to go forward. And oftentimes, you know, we have this, this cue that just like permeates through the world of coaching, which is like always push knees the knees out, out, knees out, out knees out, out, knees out, knees out. And if you just like, if you look, like the human gait cycle will tell you everything you ever need to know. The foot hits the ground, at the beginning of, of, of hitting, like when you hit the ground, you are hitting it with the outside edge of your heel, okay? The motion of your ankle is that you're going to be dorsiflexing and pronating as you, you know, load over your foot more and more and more. Uh, and then you'll ultimately reach your greatest point of being pronated and dorsiflexed, and that's your point of push off. So if you're looking at a squat at the top, you're in, it would basically be where your foot is hitting the ground. As you descend, it would be like as you're stepping over your foot if you were walking. 
So you need dorsiflexion. And if you're getting dorsiflexion, it, dorsiflexion couples with pronation. And everybody's like terrified of pronation. Oh my God, you pronated. Like your body's going to explode and the world's going to end. Okay, so it's like we've come to this enormous fear of this motion that's coupled with dorsiflexion. So it's like if you're going to be able to have your knees go forward to actually bring your hips down in a position that's actually a squat and like not have your knees collapse, like you need to be able to pronate your foot. Like when people walk, like not all humans have their knees crash into their other knees while they're pronating. Like I feel like I say this to people and they're like, you're telling me that when you're coaching a squat, you have people pronate their feet? You're actively telling them to, and I'm like, yes. I cue people to pronate their feet as they're descending because that's going to allow them to dorsiflex their ankle. And they're like, you're, you're, tell, you're killing people's knees. You're cra-. I'm like, when did I say that I want the knee to collapse inward? I don't want that. Again, I want a hammer hitting a nail going into a piece of wood. I want this alignment, but the only way I'm going to get that in a squat is if I create dorsiflexion, and the only way I'm gonna get dorsiflexion is if it couples with pronation at the same time. Um, so it's, I hope, like, I'm sure someone is going to have a conniption fit upon hearing this and like completely misinterpret it. And by all means, please do enjoy your conniption fit. Got it. <laughs> Moving on to the next question. I can't even tell you how many times that's been a thing though. It's like, yeah. I mean, to me, that's fu- it's function. It's how, yeah. how, how muscles and bones operate when we walk and breathe. It's like, yeah, you want to talk hip mechanics, look at sprint coaches, like look at gait cycle. That's. Okay, are you gonna throw this one out? Is this one mine? Let's let's go. This one mine. <laughs> if someone is having trouble achieving depth in their squat, uh, yeah, let's let's move on. It's we're 2019. Moving on. We're, moving on. we're moving on. We're moving on. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> pops up. I knew that there's gonna be some in here where I was gonna be like, this is yeah. that was the quick one. Bastardized I'm question. glad that wasn't like that was up there with like a butt wink question. It's like we're still not having this conversation. Right, this, I think this one actually would be a good conversation. <laughs> I think this gets thrown out around a lot on Instagram without a full understanding of what might actually be going on. So when the hips rise too quickly in the deadlift, whether it be sumo or conventional, what is the first performance characteristic that you look at? Were your hips too low to start? Are they rising to a position that makes them mechanically advantageous to actually initiate the lift? I don't think you need to go right to like, oh, I have block pulls or deficits or overload by erectors. It's like, maybe that's the exact position that they should be starting in. Yeah. I, I don't think it has. So usually the Occam's razor approach, like the simplest answer is usually the right answer. If your hips are rising to a point which they can actually start exerting more force, maybe that's the position you should be starting your deadlift in. Like, what was it Squ- makes makes squats more squatty again? Mm-hmm. And it's like, I think larger part, some people might actually try and squat their deadlift and then they try and deadlift their squats. I think you see this, at a lo- especially a lot with beginner lifters who adopt a more like a frame style deadlift. They try and find more like structurals, like widening their base of support. And their knees aren't under their ankles or um, under their hips or over their ankles and under their hips. And then you start to see the hips rise first. It's like, don't squat your deadlift. It's on a hands down squat, right? So I think if your hips rise first, maybe that's the exact position they should be in to start the lift. Gotcha. Do you have anything to add right to Davidson? Yeah. You know, I think um, when I see people miss a lot of lifts, they, there's, I think there's a pattern of compensation that they, that they go into. Um, or just like failure, but, but like generally speaking, I see more people fall into greater positions of like plantar flexion, uh, at the level of the ankle when you see like weird stuff go on. And if you shoot the hips up like that, it's probably going to de dorsiflex you, AKA increase plantar flexion, um, where it's like, that's the only strategy that that brain knows to be in. Like it doesn't know how to truly get into a position of like dorsiflexion, pronation, internal rotation, adduction, extension as its mechanistic driving force. It knows how to flex, abduct, externally rotate, uh, plantar flex, and supinate. So it's like, uh, it just hasn't really, to me, like the extension, internal rotation, adduction, dorsiflexion, pronation, as a coupled strategy is basically how you squeeze things. It's a, it's a compression strategy versus the other one is an expansion strategy. It's like how you blow out something. And a lot of people that are novices or weak, they don't really know how to compress. 
Uh, and, and that's they just fall into this pattern of they can't compress, so they try some other thing. Uh, and, but again, it's, it's still what you're saying because it's still a path of least resistance in terms of the brain solving a problem. Uh, I don't know how to do it this way, so I'm gonna go with this alternate strategy. Um, you know, to me, I, I always just look at like, biological organisms are a representation of the movement strategy of physics. And physics, when you really break it down, is there's two primary strategies. There is uh, withdrawal and there is moving towards something. There's compression and there's expansion. Uh, at every possible level, like gravity is just something that compresses and brings things together. Electromagnetism has repulsion capabilities, but uh, you only have one of two strategies that you can go to for movement. And one of them is an attractor and one of them is a, a repulsive one. And a lot of deadlifts are just really repulsive that, that are ugly and break down. Uh, so people are going to that particular strategy. Gotcha. I think we have time for one more question. So the last question, we are gonna throw that one out because that's gonna get dicey. Throw that one out. I'm trying to find a good one to end on here. You'd be surprised at some I, of the I questions we got would. here. I've been living in the internet for a while now. All right. I feel like this one will be this one will be a good one, and I actually don't know how you guys are gonna answer this. So does everyone now this includes no. everyone, so we can separate and differentiate between <laughs> <laughs> the right answer? Yeah, yeah the right answer. No. Yeah. no, the answer is definitely no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, all right. All right, well, how about this? Well, let's let's break perfect. it down. Let's break it down into two different categories. We'll say gin pop and then athletes, right? Sure. So do athletes, does every athlete need to squat ass to grass and back squats? And do general population need to squat ass to grass and back squats? He was right, no. no. This is... I, I wouldn't even say no. I would give context and say that not everyone even has to squat. Yep. Right? Like, again, to me, the de defining, you know, defining function is how we move when we walk and breathe. Like you can put the baby up with 300 bones and a head that's a third of the size of his body or the dude in Thailand sitting ass to grass, hacking darts, playing dice on the side of the road. But that is not proof of concept that deep squat is good for anything. Right? For athletes, it's like, you know, oh, but like, you know, you know, Kyrie hit that shot or Kawhi hit that shot and he was like in a full squat. I think that's great. That, 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 that shot was going in whether or not he was sitting in a full squat or not. That's nothing to do with it. Uh, no, athletes, athletes definitely not. Go ahead, full depth squat uh, NHL hockey player and deal with the ramifications of probably 45% of those guys having femoral acetabular impingement. Have fun. Have fun putting a $9 million asset on the shelf because you were so hard headed because all oh, the squat is king of all exercise. Like that's stupid. Like Mike Boyle hasn't squatted one of his hockey players, I'm sure of it, in 15 or 20 years, maybe longer, if ever. Uh, and general population, no. To go, it's functional. It's like, and they, you know, I love the starting strength. They like they put the guy on the toilet. It's like, look, if you're taking more shits than you are steps in a day, it's like you have very few days left on this earth. You have amoebic dysentery, and you're going to die. <laughs> so it's like, you, like, get really good at putting one foot in front of the other. So no, like it's so silly. I just, I just, I can't even argue with these people anymore. It's like, look, you want to do it, go for it. You want to squat, you know, Karen from a crowning ass to grass, sweet. If she can do it and she can maintain that position, she has like the mobility or whatever, yeah, go, go for it, man. Like, is it goal specific to what she wants? Probably not. Um, yeah, I think there's a dogmatism built around squatting that hopefully as information gets out there and it's better information that people will stop this silly conversation. So athletes know, and Jake, uh, Jen, Jen Pop now. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely. I think, you know, I'll, I'll just add my little nuggets to this. But it's like, um, you know, what is the person's goal? Again, like, and, and there's, I, I, I have, well, you get them nowadays, but like almost no general population client's goal is to be a great squatter and to add as much weight to the squat as possible. They're usually looking for some kind of aesthetic goal. And you do not need to squat to look better aesthetically. You know, you, there are a million other tools that you can use that will, you know, promote the acquisition of more lean tissue. And the kitchen is always going to be the place where we're going to have to go in terms of losing body fat. Um, you know, but the, the, like, yeah, the idea that the squat is essential to drive people towards their goals is, is unfounded. It's, it's like the muscles don't care how it is that the tension got put on them to be able to create adaptations 
and to lead to a protein synthesis response and to add lean body mass. Um, you know, it, so it, it really is crazy. And, you know, like I, I spend so much time putting people on machines and it's like, you know, uh, it's funny because the rate that I charge in Manhattan is ludicrous to put people on like chest supported rows and leg presses, but it's a better choice than, you know, oftentimes free weights. You know, they're, I'm, I'm going to keep this person healthy for the long run. I'm going to be able to actually load, like the majority of general population clients, I don't even think the squat's a great exercise, even if they can do it, because psychologically it scares the shit out of them to have that much weight on their back. And, you know, the leg press, at least I can actually train their legs to the point where their legs are pretty close to failure. Um, and, you know, and then it's like, as soon as they go heavy one time and they get sore squatting, they think they're injured. And now it's like, now it's this whole like psychosocial game of like trying to reintroduce this exercise. And it's like, is it even worth it? Like, it doesn't even make a damn difference. Like, so it's, and for athletes, again, it's like, you know, let's take a look at even like the great basketball players. When you see their Instagram videos of them squatting, just don't squat. Okay. Like uh, it's the ugliest squats that have ever been posted on the internet. Uh, whoever coached it that way should probably be just like, I don't know, like in the, the, the Bane Batman movie where they, you know, they're being tried by the scarecrow psychologist and they have to walk out on the ice until they fall through. That should be the punishment for anybody who coached that exercise that way. Um, All I can think about is that LeBron video. I was just LA. about to bring that I, up. Like he was like, what was like a, a 38 inch box squat or something like that. He was pulling I'm, to the right because he had a hard. I may flow. or may not have been alluding to that video without <laughs> yeah. specifically no, going with care. the we'll, name. I'll, but, I'll name names. Okay. Yeah, I, I saw you, I saw you smirk right I here in, in Brooklyn. Was. I don't give a shit. LeBron <laughs> oh, was pulling man. to the right because he had 130 million dollars in his back pocket. He didn't give a fuck either. It's, <laughs> he's not draining like the clutch fucking free throws because he's good or not good at squatting. Yeah. It's like John Elway's trying coach always said look my my job is to make sure john doesn't trip over fucking dumbbells in the weight room you're not going to make an athlete like that in a sport like that better right silly so no the answer i mean yes as soon as does everyone no it's yeah. it's it's if you are a power lifter you need to back squat if you are any other human on the planet you do not need to back squat awesome i love that and i think hopefully people will take something away from that and hopefully apply it to other Honest, honestly exercise especially with the barbell and some of the dogma that comes around with it but we are out of time a major thank you to dr pat davidson dr Dor jordan shallow for coming into the barbell office here in brooklyn before we head out i would love if you guys could drop some plugs i'll obviously drop down their contact info in the description of this article itself but where can people find you yep you can find me on instagram uh i'm at dr pat davidson and if you go in there, my bio link has pretty much everything you could need to find further information on me. But uh, I've got Rethink the Big Pattern as a seminar that is continuing and ongoing, and I'm finishing up the book for that as well, which I'm hoping will be uh, a big deal. I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that ultimately being finished and out there. Awesome. Uh, and go to Pat's Power Hour as well. Oh, Come yeah, on, man. You. Dude, I got to be your company, man? Yeah, I'm brutal at this no, stuff. No, it's all right. I got uh, So <laughs> go to my Instagram and then click on the, who I follow and go to Pat's and then click on his Power Hour and sign up for that. Uh, so I'm at the underscore muscle doc, uh, the underscore muscle underscore doc on Instagram. Um, seminars next year, same kind of deal. Um, we're doing a handful international, uh, New Zealand, Australia, UK, Canada, um, California. And that's all at www.pre-fit.com. Awesome. Well, thank you again, guys. Hopefully we can do this again when you all are back in town. And to. we will see you guys later. <laughs>